Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NAMLE 2021 Conference on Media Literacy. My name is Larissa Piltola, and I will be today's moderator. I'm a second year graduate student studying human rights at Columbia University. And I'm honored to welcome and introduce these two extraordinary women who will guide us through what will no doubt be an incredible and informative discussion today. They both have very impressive and rather long bios, which you can read on their respective websites, but for today, I'll keep it brief. Sister Rose Bacotti is a media literacy education specialist and a film critic who holds a doctorate in ministry. Bonnie Bounza has dedicated her life to human rights and social justice advocacy and works closely with filmmakers, artists, distributors, and non-governmental organizations to develop and execute social impact campaigns for films and documentaries. And she also happens to be my mother. Like uh, thank you. Her proud mother. <laughs> Thank you both for being here today. Uh, we really appreciate it. And before I share our presentation, we really want this to be a collaborative conversation today. So feel free for both of you to jump in when you want uh, to say something. And now with that being said, I'll go ahead and share our screen and we can start the discussion. All right, can everyone see? Yes. yes. Perfect. So today's event is called Hollywood and Hope, looking at social impact entertainment, human rights and social justice through a media literacy lens. So, we, so this is us. And then uh, I'd like to start off with you, Sister Rose. What is media literacy education and why is it important both to teach and to develop these skills? And additionally, do you feel that there is a good age to really start learning media literacy? Those are great questions, Larissa. And media literacy education is basically learning how to read and write media in all its forms, from the traditional or legacy forms of media, film, radio, television, to new forms, of course. And the age to begin the process of learning to question the media happens from the time the parent brings the child to their first experience and encounter with television or any screen that they have available. And the way they do this is to engage as if they were reading a book. When they see something on the screen, oh, there's an ice cream like we have. Oh, look at that little boy helping the other little child. These are all ways that they begin to get the child to not just be passive, but to actively engage in what's going on the screen in front of them. So if you're going to leave your child in front of a screen from a very young age, which is not recommended by the way, and then to have that time limited, this is all by, the, by doctors and by psychologists, psychiatrists, educators, you know, to limit screen time because uh, we don't really know the complete impact on the brain yet. But if whatever age we start, we watch with them and we engage in a conversation. They need to know that communication with parents is normal and that they're not being interruptive when they get involved in what's happening in the story on the screen. But media literacy education is really to access, analyze, evaluate, and then learn to create media, to have some kind of action there. And it involves, of course, a reflection and joining in, participating in the greater conversation about that media artifact. So you're saying it's really never too early to start jumping on the media literacy bandwagon. Never too early and never too old <laughs> Excellent. to be involved, to be engaged. Perfect. So Bonnie, I'd actually like to ask you uh, how you feel media literacy interacts with the work you do in human rights and just human rights and social justice in general. Well, I think um, uh, it intersects directly if we want to report on or tell stories about human rights and social justice. If we desire a more informed and civically engaged society, then we need to incorporate critical thinking in our conversations about social justice to better evaluate and understand the media and the viewpoints that we are consuming. Uh, I think that this will broaden our perspectives and allow for critical analyses of different viewpoints. We need to teach young people about what they are reading and watching to better understand those issues and messages and how they relate to their own experiences. 
Um, a good example right now where we really do need media literacy is in the discussion of the 1619 Project and critical race theory. We are hearing so many people saying why it should be taught or why it should be banned, why the 1619 Project is necessary, you know, why it's not necessary. But so many of these people are talking without actually understanding what the project is or what critical race theory is. So it is to me of paramount importance when you're teaching um, media literacy to understand that when we're talking about social justice or human rights, it is so important to view it through that lens. And again, this example of 69 critical race theory, this debate is gonna keep going on. I just wish that the debate would happen more with people having a real understanding of both sides. Well, you know, and there's also the use of the term critical thinking. It right. seems to have been co-opted by so many people because it sounds good, but exactly. people really understand what it means to really question. And it's a skill set when it comes to media literacy education and critical thinking with media education because we're always asking questions about how media are constructed. What are the viewpoints that are embedded? What are the values that are embedded? Um, and to understand that we're not all going to see the same thing the same way, but yet we can come together and talk about it peacefully. The conversation, it's all in the conversation and how we relate to one another. So there's a community building process that goes on with media literacy education as well. And as regarding critical um, race theory, I've noticed that people who push back against it are often people who are white. They, they're not people of color. And I think that there's a certain fear that's embedded there. But if we talk more through the stories that we see, if we talk about them together, I think we start to unpack some of what makes us afraid. Mm -hmm. That's my theory. I agree. And I think to your point on critical thinking, uh, and the skills necessary and the objectivity that we need to listen to both sides of it, right? Then if, if you, you follow that train of thought, then you cannot possibly reach the conclusion which so many people are just throwing out there's an excuse to not teach critical race theory and saying, oh, it's just saying, you know, all white Americans are racist. That's not what that says. But without the critical thinking skills, without your willingness to embrace the objectivity and to really, how about read what it's about, learn about the 1619 project and then have an informed opinion and that's where to me media literacy is is really important because you need to have that informed opinion in order to talk about you know whether it's issues films documentaries you know whatever media we're talking about to really speak to it um from a, a point of view of a real deep level of understanding and there's the whole democratization of that is provided by media, especially when we're sharing. So right. power is diffused and shared in a, in a good sense, the ability to do good. And so I think some people might be afraid of losing power. Yeah. And, but that's media literacy can help, I think, really open up the conversation so that we can look at being in this world together. Agree. Not in silos. Agree one hundred percent. We can probably yeah, so oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say I'd actually love to get your opinion on Catholic education in particular. I mean, I was fortunate. I think all of us here were fortunate enough to have been able to attend Catholic schools growing up. I mean, I went to Catholic school up until college, and I felt that my all girls Catholic high school education was it was really where I was challenged to embrace social justice and human rights. And I know that that is not the same environment that a lot of people my age and younger have grown up in. Um, I would really love to get your opinion on how, speak about media literacy as it respects to and relates to Catholic education in particular. Well, you know, Catholic education is really very interested in human dignity and the common good. Mm -hmm. Those are, we'll come, get to this later, but it's the, you know, the themes of Catholic social teaching also um, are present in um, education, in Catholic educational theory, if you will. And um, that comes through in how we treat one another, how we get along, and how we care about others. And that comes, there's the whole idea of character education that, that is um, embedded in Catholic education. 
but I think one of the key things is the idea of the whole person. Mm -hmm. And in a recent document that came out from the Vatican called the Directory for Catechesis or the Directory for Sharing Faith would be, would be the, the secular interpretation of that. They talk a lot about the idea of integrating a person's uh, thoughts, their mind, their, their behavior, their emotions. So that we're not just teaching concepts to the brain or we're just not trying to uh, create devotional people with the heart. No, we want to we want to help the whole person grow and become integrated um, members of society that participate in society, imbued with, of course, gospel values. That's what Catholic education is all about. But it is really based in human dignity and the common good. And I think that um, media literacy has those two core concepts embedded there as well. It's the concept or the anthropology, I guess, of media literacy education. We could go on and on about that. But I think we can assume that Catholic education, that's Catholic education and media literacy education. It's really concerned about the person and the person in society in relation in this mediated world that we live in. Thank you for that. I, Bonnie, I wanted to get your perspective. You are one of the leaders in the space of social impact entertainment as it relates to Hollywood. Can you discuss what social impact is and how that space has evolved over the years? I will. And then I'm just looking at, uh, you know, this slide and then maybe sister can, you know, talk about this slide with, with what I'm saying. So social impact entertainment is actually a, a relatively new term. Um, social impact itself means to make a change or an impact in society. Social impact entertainment uh, is media, whether that's documentaries, film, TV shows, musical, you know, digital space, using the story that's created to engage an audience and through the awareness of the story that is being told to then inspire and mobilize people to act. To take that action, that advocacy initiative, uh, that the impact campaign for the film talks about and engaging people to take that action for the greater good. Um, I know we're going to get into examples in a little bit, but you know, as, as, as far as the history of it, it, it is a very new term. Um, before it was social impact, it was social action. And before it was social action, frankly, they were, they were called human rights campaigns. And I'll get into that a little later when we're on the slide with that, but that is what social impact is. I've been in the space of social impact entertainment for 20 years. I was one of the first ones to start it with my colleagues at Amnesty International. And when we go through some of the case studies, I will give you examples of how those movies were able to make both short and long-term impact because of public engagement with those films. And those are terms that go right along with what media literacy education is all about. So as we move forward, we'll, I think we'll see it'll become even more clear. Sure. Uh, Sister, did you want to talk a little bit about how you think that they're sort of linked here on this slide? Sure. So because social justice is, is about um, changing structures that power structures that um, oppress people, basically that's what social justice is. When we see, st when we look at any media product, but we're talking about cinema in a special way today, but when we look at any media product, what we really wanna look at is how the human person is presented. Um, that would be from a social justice perspective and how the human community and family is, is presented and whether or not there's exploitation and, and if, uh, or a type of bullying that goes on even in the storytelling. But media literacy is about discovering the elements and the process, the skills are to learning to uh, analyze and evaluate, to analyze, of course, to access, first of all, and then to analyze what's going on and then what's really going on and then to do some kind of a value evaluation of it to reflect, to raise our awareness, to enter into dialogue with at least one other person, but maybe others, you know, there's always the water cooler conversation, but during the pandemic, we don't have that, but maybe it's coming back, but we, we're online all the time. And um, I think to talk, I belong to this group on Facebook called Binge Addicts. 
<laughs> and it is the loveliest group I belong to. Everybody on that list talks about what they're watching, what they like, and why. And what, what a beautiful thing to do because we're, we love stories. And in this time of the pandemic, most of us have been online watching stories. We're creating a community of dialogue and we're able to share without um, ne toxic negativity, which can emerge sometimes online. That's, that's a great group. But we're doing, we're going through these steps. And even though they might not know who I am, by what I say and what I contribute, I can add to this. And that's what va the value of being a media literate person is that you can talk about social justice, you can talk about stories that look at a, a structures that oppress people and you can talk about them and share about them. And um, but we'll get into that in relation to charity on another level. But I think that the, the link there is that um, we're about the same thing. We're about the good of the human person, the human community, and entering into the public space and participating in it through dialogue about media. And I look at these um, different sections here, and these are the very ones that I use uh, as the pillars for building my impact campaign deck. So just, just reflecting all of these, you know, I take into consideration when I build a campaign around awareness, advocacy, and action. So we're and I just, want, I just want to say that when I came out to Los Angeles almost 20 years ago, and somehow Bonnie Abounza found me and brought me into these great screenings and press days and press events about social impact entertainment, although we were just beginning to call it that. And that's why I'm so proud to have Bonnie and um, Larissa with us today, us all together, because we've been working in this space now for quite a while. And I'm very grateful because I get the films and I get to review them through a media literacy, social justice lens. And I love that. I love working with you. <laughs> I would, um, yeah, I definitely like to move on now to, you know, you guys have been mentioning social impact entertainment. Um, find this slide here. I guess, um, Bonnie, you can you go back to the two feet there for a minute? Yeah. yeah. So we, just to say that social justice is about being actively involved in changing the structures that oppress people. Mm -hmm. But it's another foot is charity and that's doing good to the person in front of you, as Mother Teresa used to say. So they work together. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Okay. But sometimes our emphasis is one or the other, and that's okay. We need both. And I will add to that, and I agree 100%, because when I build out my campaigns, I always go to those charities and non-governmental organizations. I really lean into them because they're the ones doing the work day in and day out. So if I'm going to develop calls to action or any kind of advocacy initiatives, I turn to those organizations. And in some instances, the charitable component is a big part of it. And I can give you an example shortly on that. Uh, and in other instances, it's the NGOs that they're working that we need for the calls to action, but they do, you know, uh, work well together. I would love to just building off of that, get both of your opinions on, I know you mentioned the 1619 project earlier. What, what do you both do when you're met with this resistance to critical thinking, resistance to social change or to social justice? I mean, what, what, what do you do when you're met with, with something like that? I would say maybe Bonnie, do you want to jump on first and then Sister Rose, you can follow? Well, because all of the projects that I work on solely fall under social justice, human rights, civil rights, I always have to anticipate the resistance. Always. Um, you know, it's, it's in this, you know, now we're, we're such a polarized country. But I have to factor that in as to how I'm going to execute a campaign that is going to bring in the widest audience possible. And I have to tackle the issues of where's that resistance coming from, mm -hmm. right? If people aren't using critical thinking skills and they're just making an assumption about the filming campaign, it's my job um, to be able, either through the partnerships that are put together or the op-eds that are written as part of the campaign, um, you know, anything we do with panels to address those issues directly because I'm never gonna change anybody's mind, but I'm hoping that they'll um, be able to see the other side of it. 
And if they can change their minds, fantastic. And if I have to Trojan horse the message, I'll Trojan horse the message. But I need to understand the other side in order to really run an effective campaign. And I'm hoping that the campaign will then uh, allow those people uh, who are resistant to see, okay, there is this other viewpoint. I can see where there's value to this film and this campaign. So that's what I'm hoping for. But you know, to go out and say, I'm absolutely gonna change the mind of somebody who does not believe um, you know, uh, uh, about systemic racism in this country. Well, it's my job to try and let this, make sure that they're open to hear another opinion rather than saying, I'm gonna change your mind because that just doesn't work. For myself, uh, I don't get as much pushback from the, the uh, films themselves, unless there's some content in it that some people are very sensitive to. That could be violence. I mean, if you look at Blood Diamond, there's quite a bit of uh, violence in there. But, you know, Flannery O'Connor, who's a great writer, wrote about fiction, that you need enough violence and enough sex, you out, sexuality in a film to make it believable. And that's all, you don't need to, to go overboard. And I think the films that, uh, that we've worked on or that you've brought to me um, have all been balanced there. Sometimes I get pushback, like the film The Constant Gardener was about pharmaceutical testing, right? Yep. And people who will push back and say, well, that's not my experience of the pharmaceutical industry. And I'll say, well, here's some, links for you, you know, I'll try to, but you're right, that you can't change people's minds, but you could hopefully plant some seeds, raise awareness, or maybe touch their curiosity a little bit. And I think uh, staying in a non-defensive stance is useful, but sometimes it's a little hard because I know for myself, I tend to get passionate about what I'm talking about. But um, that's, that's the, um, the most that I get are some people who think a film should be for uh, children five to adults who are 95. Not every film is for that audience. To your point so, on- Those Constant are some of the issues Gardner. I face. To your point on Constant Gardner, because I ran that campaign when I was at Amnesty, I remember getting a call from a woman who worked at a pharmaceutical company. And she said, I take offense at this film and your campaign because well, don't you, you know, you use Advil and Tylenol and she rattled off a number of other medications. And I said, yes, I do, but that's not what the movie's about. And this is not a wholesale condemnation of the pharmaceutical industry. We're talking about an aspect of it, which is true, which is testing with these drugs that are expired, testing on a very vulnerable population because they happen to be a black population. They're Africans and that does happen. This is not, you, you didn't see the right film or it's your own guilty conscience. But I am not talking about, you know, the, you know, the, the medications, the drugs that we all use, of course. And this is not saying the pharmaceutical companies are horrible, but we're saying that there are aspects of that industry that are, and we need to address it and we need to bring it to the public forum. So, but that's, you know, to your point, I was never gonna change this woman's mind, but I wasn't gonna allow her, you know, to just to attack and not respond either. Yeah, you guys are both pointing to the issue of getting people to listen to, to another perspective and another opinion. We also, we also have, need to listen too, right? Because um, why, why has this touched them so deeply? And right. so how we, how we can work with that in charity is also incumbent upon us. Right. I would love to talk a little bit more about your campaigns, Bonnie. Um, you know, as we've mentioned, we've discussed, you've You've run a number of them and I, they are countless. I don't think any of us can rattle off all of the campaigns that you've worked on in, in the decades that you've been in the business, but those films and series tend to be about very niche topics that many people simply don't know or care about. Can you talk about how you're able to run these campaigns while also making them appeal to broader communities? How can you get people to care? How can you get them to listen? Yeah, thanks for that question. This slide has the report um, from the UCLA Skull Center for Social Impact Entertainment. And it is a landmark report. And for anybody that's watching, you, you know, you can go uh, to the Skull Center uh, at UCLA and, and download this report. It's a really important report because it's the landscape of social impact entertainment. And it's the first report that has covered really the last 10 years of, of media that has focused on messages 
and how to mobilize the public. And I'll actually read something from um, this report, which I think is, is obviously the, the crux of what we're talking about here. Story has the ability to build bridges of understanding, tolerance, empathy, and respect, helping us to make sense of our lives and the world around us. The time has come to use the infinite power of story as expressed through entertainment and performing arts to inspire social impact. So it's very worth reading this report. And again, the value of these social impact campaigns is to take stories that, as you said, Larissa, some of them are very niche, some of them are very, you know, uh, inside baseball, you know, people in human rights or civil rights, you know, in the environment, you know, they know these issues, but the global public doesn't necessarily know them. So the value of these campaigns is we're able to take the media created by entertainment companies, reach as wide an audience as possible as we can, educate them about the issue, and then give them the ability to take further action if they're inspired to do so. Um, I would like to say uh, the word impact, I think uh, sometimes uh, for me, what comes to mind with impact is like a uncontrollable uh, impact, you know, a car crash, you can't right. do anything about it. I, I love the word influence. And I think sometimes that that is, um, that is a, a gentler word, I think. And, and in fact, that is, we're trying to plant seeds that will move people to mobilize and to change and to act. But um, impact, for some people, impact and influence mean the same thing. Well, the dictionary you know, doesn't agree, but people <laughs> You know, in the evolution of the terminology about social impact entertainment, as I said, we were doing this at Amnesty International, and they were human rights film campaigns. That's what they were called. And then Jeff Skull and Participant Media came on the scene. I was doing this in 2000. I think Jeff came on 2003, 2004, and had a social action division at Participant Media. So, it was, so social action, which I always like, because action is, okay, you can take you know, this particular action to move the needle, right? And then it evolved into social impact. So just so everybody knows, there were originally, you know, human rights film campaigns, social action campaigns, and now they're called social <laughs> impact campaigns. So that's- well, It means making a difference, right? Right, it's making a difference, that's making right. Difference. Yeah. You know, inspiring change, exactly. Yeah, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about some of the popular campaigns that you've worked on. Maybe if you could describe how you were able to raise awareness in each of these, how you were to bring about social change, and what you saw potentially similarities with um, media literacy. Sure, and I'll let Sister weigh in on the media literacy part, and I'll, I'll go through these rather quickly, or we could be here for hours. So Blood Diamond. <clears throat> it is still held up as an example of an impact campaign that has had long legs and long-term impact. So the term blood diamond, which is conflict diamond, was something that was very insular, um, you know, inside baseball in the human rights world. And what this movie did, because it had Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Connelly and Jaiman Hunsu, is that it brought this story to the public. This is what's happening in Africa right now in diamond mining that is controlled by these rebel forces is a true story of what happened um, in the Civil War in Sierra Leone. Warner Brothers came to us and to Global Witness, our partner on um, Conflict Diamonds work, and said, let's work together. Because we had this powerful film, which we knew we could get out to a global audience. And Warner Brothers wanted Amnesty members, who are not only the built-in audience for this, but we are the people that are going to help educate, inspire, and mobilize others to take action. And so with this, you know, in teaching people about the Kimberly process, which is the certification process for diamonds, we created these downloadable toolkits and pamphlets. We, we produced PSAs with the celebrities. We had human rights activists talking about uh, what the Kimberly process meant and why we all had to be involved. Because we all, you know, diamonds have always been, thanks to marketers, symbols of love. If you love somebody, you give them a diamond and you get engaged, right? You love, you know, you're, you're 16 year old, turning 16, you give her a little, di you know, little diamond pendant. It's always been that symbol of love. We said, well, hang on, that's not necessarily true because look where this diamond comes from and the crimes against humanity that are being committed in extracting those diamonds. So what we did with activists, Amnesty activists, is we had a national day of action on conflict diamonds and we deployed amnesty members across the country. Larissa, I think was 10 years old 
and we went to jewelry stores across the country. We went in and asked those jewelers, can you certify that your diamond is conflict free? Okay, so it did not come from a mine where human rights violations were being committed. If they could, they would show us the, the Kimberly process certification. And then we waited outside and as people walked in, and this was all leading into Valentine's Day, we asked customers coming in, can you please ask them if their diamonds are conflict free? And we would teach them about it, we'd give them pamphlets. It's a massively um, successful campaign, the press wrote about it. In fact, we distributed, I don't know if you can see these, these were the rubber bracelets, popular back then. It says blood diamond on one side, clean diamond on the other. We also had this pin of a blood diamond, which Leonardo wore and you know, the other celebrities wore in the film. And we distributed those. And the awareness that was raised and the term blood diamond then became part of the cultural lexicon, the populist vernacular. People now know what a blood diamond is. And in fact, the blood diamond campaign the curriculum that we develop for it are taught in high schools and colleges. And whenever I speak at conferences, you know, any kind of event, people come up to me and say, you know, I know what a blood diamond is, you know, and that's why I, I asked before I bought it or I buy synthetic diamonds. I don't even want to be part of, you know, real diamonds. So we saw what kind of an impact it made uh, in the public's consciousness. And then even years later, that campaign was 2006. In 2018, I was contacted, um, by uh, a former trial lawyer for the Special Court for Sierra Leone, who said to me that his organization was going to be holding a number of the Western players who made millions off of blood diamonds um, that were involved during Sierra Leone, and he wanted to know how I executed my campaign. So 12 years, well, 13 years after the release of that film, the campaign is still having an impact. So sister, I don't know if you want to weigh in on. I'll just say one thing. I'm watching a series on Netflix right now called Black Earth Rising. And it's about uh, a, a young woman who's from Rwanda. She was adopted as a, as a child, a baby survivor. But one of the scenes in early on in this series, which is kind of riveting, is um, about these um, soldiers trying to get into Rwanda with diamonds and other goods that they have to prove by certification are conflict free and because they cannot do that they are not allowed into rwanda at this in this particular fictional series and i'm thinking this whole idea of conflict uh, diamonds and other goods is still current this this series was made it was released two years ago so this is something that's still like you said is still current years on yep now you have blood gold campaigns, blood mineral campaigns, blood chocolate campaigns. All that came from the blood diamond campaign because they were all- I would say blood diamond as well as being taught in um, colleges and universities, the campaign in particular has been cited in several textbooks. Just chime in there. So thank you. So that just shows you it was a successful movie, a successful campaign that had both short and long-term impact. And I'll just go through some of these other ones quickly. Sister also knows these cries from Syria, focused on the, uh, the crisis in, uh, in Syria. And that's a campaign where we work. This is a documentary on HBO. We aligned ourselves with a number of uh, nonprofit organizations, including International Rescue Committee, Save the Children, the ACLU, UNICEF. And we used the film to raise awareness about the work of those organizations we screened at the Council on Foreign Relations. We screened at Google, Open Society. We screened um, with the uh, Lantos Commission in the US Congress. We um, had meetings with, um, with congressional members. We also screened at the World Justice Forum at The Hague. This was a campaign that was, that was international. And we were asking for certain calls to action, which included humanitarian aid, um, you know, pressuring governments globally to try and intervene and stop the bloodshed in Syria. And one of the, one of the interesting um, calls to action that we had and one of the initiatives that we had involved using the film with the Department of Homeland Security. Case officers in the East Coast of the United States used the film to learn about the individuals, the Syrians who were escaping, why they were fleeing, and why they were seeking asylum in the United States. And so they use it as an educational tool, which is something we never even anticipated doing something with the Department of Homeland Security. 
but they saw the value uh, in the film. And, um, you know, we had bipartisan meetings, as I mentioned. We also had screenings, you know, in Europe um, with, um, you know, different members of the European Parliament, European Council of Human Rights. So this was a film that was really embraced uh, and people knew that it's one that could be used as an educational tool and really support the work of non-governmental organizations that, you know, were, were helping refugees and trying to stop the violence. Um, I'm going to talk about The Heart of Nuba because this is a very special one for myself and sister. So The Heart of Nuba, and it's an interesting one, this is the niche that you were talking about, Larissa. So this is the story of Dr. Tom Katina, Catholic doctor in the Nuba Mountains of Sudan. He was the only doctor for one million Sudanese, and he had a staff of Sudanese um, nurses and aides, but he was the only doctor. At a Catholic hospital, the only Catholic hospital, hospital, right? Another Mercy Hospital. Mm -hmm. What people didn't know, you know, they, they heard Sudan, they might have known about Darfur. But what they didn't know were the war crimes, crimes against humanity, what I considered a genocide against the people in the Nuba Mountains by, by President Omar al-Bashir. And what Tom was doing was, was not only saving lives, but he was documenting those crimes against humanity in a book. So that book can be presented as evidence to the International Criminal Court. Now, this was a very small movie. And what we did is we put a coalition of over 65 organizations together that were working on Sudan, working on human rights. We brought in celebrities who cared about Africa and in Sudan in particular. And we developed a campaign where we got the movie to all of them, the NGOs were able to use it to raise awareness internationally. And on International Human Rights Day, uh, let me just get the year on that, what happened. Um, so on International Human Rights Day, when this movie came out four years ago, what we did, and, and, the, and the day before, which was the, the, so International Human Rights Day is the 10th of December, the 9th of December is the International Day of Commemoration Dignity of the Victims of the Crime of Genocide and the Prevention of the Crime. We had screenings globally that day. We had a screening um, with, at The Hague, the ICC. We had a screening with Congress. We had a screening uh, with the House of Lords. We had a screening with the mayor of Paris. We had a screening in Rome. We targeted all these screenings on that day, December 10th, around the world to raise awareness about what was happening and what was happening with Dr. Katina. And in those efforts, one of the things is that we were able to raise over one year, $1 million to help Mother Mercy Hospital. And Tom ended up winning the Aurora Prize. He was the second recipient and that's a prize that was established by the Armenian community um, because they are survivors of a genocide and they wanted to honor him for his humanitarian efforts. And then I'll turn it over to sister because she gave the filmmaker Ken Carlson the Catholics and Media Award. For this way. So I'll turn it over to you, sister, on this. Campaign. That's true. But before I talk about that, Bonnie, mm -hmm. um, didn't um, didn't Bashir stop bombing the Nuba Mountains because of the pressure brought by this movie? Yes. And so that aid was able to get in again? Correct. Thank you for, for pointing that out. In fact, Ken Carlson met with President Al Bashir. And the pressure brought to bear internationally stopped the bombing. And we were talking about establishing a humanitarian corridor. He was not allowing aid to get in. So humanitarian aid that was coming in was being blocked. Because of this campaign, the pressure of this, this movie and the organizations and the number of people who got together in church groups, in synagogues, in you know, these community organizations, um, school children, they all band together to raise money, to talk about this, to show the film. And the bombing did stop and aid was allowed in. So thank you for that, Sister. I mean, it's a really important thing. I should have just probably started with that. But well, that goes, Larissa, a niche story that when you put the right, you know, groups together on it, you engage the public. This is a really great metric on this campaign. Yeah, it, and it shows that these type of films can move the needle and to a great and help people and really 
and, and do good to people. So we have a group here in Los Angeles that uh, called Catholics and Media Associates. And we did award a social justice award to the heart of Nuba to Ken Carlson and Maria, Maria Shriver was there because she's an executive producer on the film. And it all came together at the Religious Education Congress here in Los Angeles. What would that have been about three years ago, right, Bonnie? Yes. And Bonnie herself is a recipient of the Catholics and Media Social Justice Honored Award. Honored to be a recipient, yes. yes. Yes, as is Evgeny, um, who was the director for Cries of Syria, for his his work in um, in social justice films. And so, anyway, that and they are, I think uh, Heart of Nuba also received a Gabriel Award from the uh, Catholic Media Conference because I got to accept for Ken because he right. couldn't be there. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Now that was a wonderful campaign. And again, to your point, Larissa, Blood Diamond is a big studio movie. Cries from Syria, big cable company. This was an independently released film, a niche audience that had great impact. And I'll just say to those watching, because you know we, we're uh, you know very cognizant of time here. If you're interested in seeing examples of these campaigns, contact me. You'll see at the end my email, and I'm happy to send you the decks so you see how a campaign is developed and the metrics from that campaign. Very good. Yeah, and I, I, it seems to me, it seems very clear that these streaming services, distributors, these, you know, HBOs and Netflix, they're, they're really getting on the bandwagon of promoting social justice and getting behind these um, social impact campaigns. So I don't know if you wanted to, either of you wanted to speak to that a bit and, and how it also affects their bottom line as well. Well, I'm very pleased to see that films that are, um, are telling stories about what's going on in the world today are right there on the major streaming services and people are watching them. I mean, Netflix does its top 10 films and if you look at any given time, there's probably something there that's going to be looking either at the human person or structures of power that are oppressing people, but also telling stories of the heroes and heroines who are out there in the field doing the work. But know that there are people behind these films that are also trying to uplift humanity by promoting these social impact entertainment um, products or productions. So there's a, there's a big machine there. Yeah, there are embedded values, yes. And the questions here that, that um, I think are important for media literacy educators to ask. And Bonnie, why don't you take this one? So uh, I agree with you, sister. I mean, in 20 years, I have seen you know, resistance to what were called impact campaigns because everybody thought, oh, you know, you're going to be- you Our know, movie star shouldn't tell us what to do. And, and we don't want oh, to no, you know, if, if I wanted, you know, a message, I would go to church or synagogue to get a message from, you know, my priest or rabbi. You know, I don't want, you know, left-leaning messages. I want to be entertained. I mean, every possible excuse, you know, it's spinach. I don't, you know, I don't like spinach. I don't want to go see a movie that's essentially spinach. I have seen in 20 years that perspective change from Hollywood and distributors to the general public. And I think you see now, especially with, with the streamers, more of these movies coming out. You really see that in documentaries now too. And finally, I think Hollywood has understood, okay, we can have a great bottom line. We can also have a great campaign and that campaign can help. So an impact campaign does not replace a marketing campaign. In the end, these movies are made because these filmmakers want an audience to see their films. That is still the first priority. They believe in the story. And they it has, believe in the story. It has to That's be a powerful story no matter right. what, or it won't go anywhere. That's right. And we can take that powerful story as impact producers and, and tell them, this is only going to help you. We can help market your movie. We can help promote your movie. We can bring in a built-in audience for your movie. That built-in audience can go to their vast networks and say, tune in and watch this movie. And then there's also the press element of it. There are more stories than the people can write because there is an impact campaign, because it is, it is a movie about an issue. We also Trojan horse messages. I mean, a funny story that I always tell, which is very true, and that's with Lord of the Rings. And Amnesty wanted the, the second installment, The Two Towers, as a fundraiser for our work. And when I went to the distributor, they're like, are you crazy? 
you know, Lord of the Rings, we don't need amnesty. You know, this is, no, this is not a message movie. This is, you know, it's based on books and, you know, it's a fantastic series. Well, I then went to Peter Jackson, the director, who I knew was a supporter of human rights. And I asked him, I said, would you be willing to give us this film as a premiere? And would you be willing to film a PSA? Because, and he said, well, what's your reasoning behind it? And I said, because what's happening in Two Towers and in, 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 in the trilogy is that the orcs want to commit genocide against the human race. And I just threw it out there, not knowing if he thought I was, you know, needed, you know, to see a therapist. And he laughed and he said, you know, you're right. And it's true. What do the orcs want to do? They want to wipe out the human race. So he gave us the film. We were able to have the premiere of the Two Towers. We were able to get Amnesty's message out there on human rights. And we had a beautiful PSA from Peter Jackson. So I even say in even movies like that, we can Trojan horse the message. And I think that they go hand in hand. We're able to promote. And, and now 20 years after this whole idea uh, was started of impact campaigns, you know, now fully embraced. So what makes social impact entertainment different from other productions? Like, um, I don't know, uh, Harry, 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 Harry Potter, for example. Well, I could make a case on Twi Harry Potter Twilight well. series. I mean, you're taking over my job, sister. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Go ahead. Not every, not every movie, you know, not every series is going to have an impact campaign, right? I will only take on a movie if I really feel I can make a difference. If I feel I can move the needle on an issue that is raised in that film. If I don't feel I can, then I won't take it on. And there are some movies that, you know, it's fine. They, they shouldn't have impact campaigns, right? Even though Avengers has human rights messaging in there, the Avengers doesn't need an impact campaign. But then there are those movies like Blood Diamond, you know, and Hotel Rwanda, you know, and City of God, and all of those that, that deserve these kinds of campaigns. I just worked on one called Four Good Days about addiction and recovery. And the campaign actually drove box office on that because there's an audience there. So many families are being impacted by opioid use and drug abuse and you know, that campaign, which is an entirely grassroots driven impact campaign, drove box office on that. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on, on the project. I think briefly, I'd like to just uh, ask one more question, just tying in social impact, entertainment and media literacy. I would love to get both of your opinions on the role that empathy plays within these mediums. Is it, where, where exactly does it start? It, does it start with production and creating empathy? Does it have to have uh, the, the audience already be empathetic or is that created in that capacity? I'd love to get just briefly your perspectives on that. So, you know, here's the thing. I don't know if you could put up the slide that has them side by side, but um, the, so, the social impact and yeah. the media yeah. others. But yeah. here's, here's the thing is that film, cinema, television, music, these are emotional mediums, media. They, they go right to the heart. Um, music doesn't even go through the, uh, the brain first. It bounces off of our eardrums. And so our emotions are immediately engaged. So our, if we're touched, if we're moved by a story that we're watching, what happens is that our empathy, I think, is engaged because we're feeling something through the eyes and experience of another. So it begins, I think, with the emotional engagement um, with the film, and then is this, and then you can't replace a good story. Media literacy kind of has a cerebral, a very cerebral reputation, because this is a process that we go through that critical thinking skills, right? But we have to are we want to remember, we don't have to, we want to remember, or we, in, we are invited to remember that the whole person is engaged in the educational process. So that would be the, the mind, the emotions, the, the will, the behavior of the person. So all aspects of the person are involved. And you will see that lined up in both of these um, columns here on, on the page. So empathy, I think, comes from being moved emotionally and understanding, of course, that uh, human dignity and the common good are our top priorities. And if I can add to that, I agree 
if I can add to that, you know, you said it starts with the story, 100%. If the story is not going to engage, if the story is not told in a way that people can connect to it, the movie won't succeed and neither will the impact campaign. I cannot run a successful impact campaign unless there's empathy, period. Because what I am asking people to do is to watch this, this form of media, then, so I raise the awareness of it, I need people to connect to that story, to those characters, because if I'm gonna move them to take action, if I'm gonna move them to contact their members of Congress, if I'm going to move them to support the work of organizations, if I'm asking them to hit the streets in protests, there has to be the empathy for that. They well, have to connect to the, the story. The other thing that is that if we hope that students are getting yeah. involved in this process, well then, who are the filmmakers of tomorrow? Yeah. They're already making media as kids now because they have phones and they can do that, smartphones. But they're the storytellers of today and tomorrow. And so if, if they can get an understanding of empathy, not just explosions and you know, things that make you jump in your seat, it's, um, it's really about the engagement of the heart in the story the heart of the story. And I see this generation of young people is really having that. You know, they are connecting to these social justice issues. I mean, when you see Amanda Gorman delivering the poem that she did at the inauguration, yeah. yes. right? It's a young woman, you know? I mean, you know, barely out of her teens. And how many young people connected to her, right? How many young people are connecting to you know, these, these bands that are taking on social justice issues and their understanding. I see stories every day on the news about kids that are having, you know, selling lemonade stands and that money is going to help the homeless, right? Or during the pandemic, you know, kids that are, you know, selling their, you know, their, their toys so that they can give money so that food can be given to these food banks. These are the kids that are gonna see these movies and through proper media literacy, we can really engage them and they can become those social justice warriors that we want them to be. You know, there's this new fad on YouTube of uh, girls, I think, or maybe boys too, where they're reading books and doing book reviews. Wouldn't it be interesting if we had young people doing uh, film reviews and, this, and engaging um, young people that way? because they are, going, they are going to be the storytellers and they're practicing now. Agreed, and on all my campaigns, I have what I refer to as a youth posse because, well, you know, I'm old and you know, I'm, I'm a techno peasant as my daughter will tell you. And there's some things they were like, okay, Larissa, I need to mobilize the youth posse. They need to give me their perspective on this impact campaign and how I can reach their demographic. And so uh, we need to rely more and more heavily on them and they understand and they really, and that's why media literacy is just so critically important in how we teach to these young people because they're going to absorb it and they're going to want to take action. And just to recap, media literacy means to know how to mm -hmm. access, analyze, evaluate, yeah. reflect, dialogue, and act and create. Yeah. It's reading and writing whatever the medium is. It's not just, you know, critiquing it. It's right. also, what are you doing to create media as a response to that? Exactly. Thank you both for that. I know we are running really low on time, but if there's any really quick final comments you'd like to make, I can start with Bonnie and then sister, if you wanna hop on. Well, I'm just really happy to be participating in this. When, when Sister asked me and, and asked Larissa, I just think it's so important. We're, we're so divided now as a country. And I'm just seeing where we used to have a lot more critical thinking, listen to the other person's opinion, the other side's opinion, you know, digest it, and then let's, let's you know, reach a point of understanding, if not a point of understanding, at least respect. And let's, you know, teach what these movies, these documentaries are happening. And it's just so divided now that I think it's even more important to have um, the kind of media uh, literacy training. And, you know, this quote here that, that I asked Larissa to put on, it's a quote that I have on the back of my business card. And I really think it's been a guiding 
um, principle for my life. And I think that also within media literacy, this is what we have to do. You know, and I'm very grateful to be part of this panel. I'm excited about where this is going. You know, the continued evolution of social impact and how it really is complementary and works very well with media literacy training. Oh, thank you, Bonnie and Larissa, for your understanding and, and for the work that you are doing or we're doing together because it's almost 20 years that now we've been, we've been working together. But um, I think that media literacy educators will, that this quote from the Talmud will resonate also with them because we have a passion for what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And even new uh, people just coming to media literacy education have a sense that it's important or they wouldn't be watching this now. And I think they have a sense too that there are things going on in the world that we want to change. And how do we do that? And I hope that our presentation has given folks uh, a complementary tools and skills to be, ever, to be able to continue to make a difference through education and through the production of the arts and entertainment. Exactly. Larissa, do you want to put up the slide that has our contact emails and all of that? Sure. I was going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Bye. I have a plan here. Oh, um, <laughs> thank you. All both these type A females. Sorry. No, never <laughs> so many different, so many different people. Um, thank you both so much for this brilliant conversation. I have no doubt that it could have gone on for another three to four to five hours, and as it often has between the three of us. And then if anyone in the audience would like to get in touch with Bonnie or with Sister Rose, this is their information. Um, you know, feel free to take a screenshot and get in touch with them. Obviously, they're both so passionate and know so much about their work, so they'd be happy to connect with you. And otherwise, uh, thank you again for participating. Thank you to the viewers who are watching, and we hope you enjoyed it. Can I say one more thing? Yes, of course, sister. Okay. Uh, it's not up there, but you can get in touch with me that every year we teach a media literacy training course that is certified by the Archdiocese of Los Angeles as a catechist specialization. If you're a catechist, you know what that means. But anybody can be part of that. And so contact me. This year, it's going to be the first week of August in 2021. But you can get on our mailing list uh, and, and get in touch. Thank you. I would say sign us both up. My mom and I will be there. We'll be there. Oh, yay! <laughs> of, course, of course. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.